Uh, so I'm really happy to be here. I want to say that you are some of the most important people in Ireland because uh, the entire future of the Irish economy depends upon the business community. It depends upon the entrepreneurs, the salespeople, the ones who go out there and hammer and make sales and produce products and service and deliver them. We could take all the politicians and put them on a ship and, and put them 500 miles off the coast and it probably wouldn't make any difference to the economy. Mm -hmm. But if you ever stop working, like, like they talked in Anne Rand about the strike of the men and women of the mine, the producers who just stop, everything stops. So the future is going to be a little challenging. Uh, it's going to be it's probably the most challenging time that you've experienced in your business lives. But when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And so you're just going to have to work harder. You're going to have to dig down deeper. I know that in my life, uh, we have good times, and the good times go on for a long period of time. We start to get kind of sloppy. We kind of coast. We go to work, and we have coffee, and we read the paper, and we surf a little bit of internet, maybe do a little business, business during the day, and go out on the weekends and watch sports and so on. Well, those days are gone, at least for the foreseeable future. A, uh, an economic crisis, I'm an economist by application, an economic crisis, usually you get through it in about nine months. That's the average for economic ups and downs. But uh, a financial collapse like we have experienced here, in which we're having very serious problems in the U.S., uh, usually takes five to seven years. Now, nobody likes that, but that's the reality. And Jack Welch, the um, head of uh, General Electric, was once asked, what are the most important principles of leadership? And he gave seven. But number one is what he called the reality principle. The reality principle is see the world as it is, not as you wish it were. In other words, be very honest and objective with the world as it really is. And the fact is, the world is going to become more competitive. It's already become more competitive for us here in Ireland. So we're just going to have to buckle down and work harder. But the good news is that if 10% of the economy has gone sideways, the other 90% is still functioning. People still need to eat, they need to dress, they need to drive, they need homes. And so there's always going to be business for the hustlers. And I say that in a very complimentary way. Uh, Thomas Edison once said, uh, good things come to those who wait, but only what's left over from those who hustle. <laughs> and so you and I are just going to have to hustle. And what I do is I say, all right, if times are tough, then what we do is we buckle down and we work harder. Start a little earlier, work a little harder, stay a little later, hammer away, dig, dig into the depths of our uh, creative abilities, find solutions. If we don't like the way things are going, change them, and so on. You're going to have to be quick on your feet. Um, and one of the, uh, I'm just trying to think, there's so many ideas that I can give you. Uh, let's, let's just stay with, with sales and marketing. I think that sales and marketing are the jelly and the jelly donut of business. It's really the core. We say nothing happens until a sale takes place. And so your job and my job is to make sales take place. And when I started off my career, I uh, started off quite humbly. I, uh, my family never had any money. We were always broke. Our family theme song was, uh, I can't afford it. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. Sung in every chord and bar. I think you may have grown up with the same theme song. And uh, so when I started off, I didn't graduate from high school. And the only thing I could do was laboring jobs. And I worked at laboring jobs. Uh, I worked uh, digging ditches, washing uh, dishes in the back of small hotels. I worked on farms. When I was 23 years, three years old, I was an itinerant farm laborer. I was working on the farm during the harvest. I was sleeping in the barn uh, at night, uh, getting up when it was pitch black, eating breakfast with the fa farmer's family, and then getting out into the fields by first light so we could get the crops in before the first frost. I was uneducated, I was unskilled, and at the end of the harvest, I was once more unemployed. And so when I could no longer find a laboring job, like you, I got into sales. <laughs> Don't give me that, that, oh no, this is my career path. We, sales is the ultimate default profession in Ireland. If we don't go forward into it, we fall backward into it. Sort of like backing up a car at night. You know, you back up and you hit something. Whoa! You get out to see what it is. It's a sales job. <laughs> so you say, you say, well, I'll give that a shot. Uh, so we give it a try. 80% of people who get into sales uh, still are giving it a try. They're going through the motions. In fact, some of the interesting studies that have come out, 25 years of research, show that if you take the 80-20 rule, the top 20%, like the people in this room, uh, and the bottom 80%, they find that the bottom 80% have a kind of a mindset, which where it came from, we don't know. But what they'll do is they'll work reasonably hard during their first year to master their craft so that they can do it well enough not to get fired. And then they flatline 
and they never get any better. So 80% of the population in almost any field never gets any better. Uh, they, 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 whether it's doctors or lawyers or architects or engineers or business people, you'll find people who graduated from fine universities who haven't read a book in 20 years and they're damn proud of it. Uh, they don't read, they don't learn, they don't grow, they don't go to courses. Somehow they got this idea that you get your education and then it's over. But today, in the modern age, you get your education, and then you get your education, and you get your education. And if you ever stop learning and growing, you'll be very quickly passed by somebody who continues to learn and grow. So the top 20% of people they find are very different in that they're constantly upgrading their skill set. They're constantly getting better. Whereas the bottom 80% are just platform. Well, anyway, I got into sales. I got the three-part sales training program, which was here's your cards, here's your brochures, and there's the door. Uh, just go out there and talk to people. I find that 70% or more of all companies do no sales training at all. And I had a person come up to me, uh, it was really interesting, he came up to me at a seminar and he said, I resent that. My company does a lot of training. As a matter of fact, I moved from another company where I was doing very well to this company and we train all the time. But our sales are down in what is a reasonably good market. So I, I don't think there's a link between sales training and sales results. I said, let me guess. I bet you do product training. I bet you do training on your product, but you don't do sales training. He stopped. He said, oh my God, he said, you're right. That's all we do is product training. We train people on what's in the product and how it's made and so on. He said, and he sort of, oh, certainly his, his eyes were opening. He said, in my last company, we did sales training all the time. We trained people on how to go out and make appointments and talk to people and ask questions and, and determine customer needs and so on. And here in this company, we don't do any of that. We just do product training. Oh my God. He said, thank you so much. And he wrote to me about two months later. He was a sales manager. He went back in and he stopped the product training. He said, you can do that on your own. And he began to initiate the sales training process that he had learned in his previous work. And his sales for the whole company just took off. And most people don't realize that. Many people in business, many people who own businesses have not been in the field. They've not sold. So they don't understand that sales training is so important. And so anyway, so I got this three-part sales training program. And for about six months, I struggled. I was working on straight commission, knocking on doors, knocking on office doors, and selling products from door to door. So I'd knock on doors, and uh, they'd say, well, it sounds like very good. Let me think it over. And I'd go to the next door, let me think it over. Let the next door, let me think it over. Let me think about it. Let me think it over. I soon had that whole city thinking about it. <laughs> I expected at any minute the dam would break, the phones would fall off the hook, and all those people would have finally come to the conclusion to buy my product. It wasn't until later that I learned that the words, let me think about it or let me think it over, mean goodbye forever. You're a lousy salesman, I'll never see you again or talk to you again. I'll never take your phone calls or your emails or your cover little letters. Is we will never meet again. Goodbye, goodbye. Uh, well, I would go and I wasn't afraid to work because at least it was clean work. So I'd get up in the morning and somebody said, you know, sales is not a sales business, it's a rejection business. So the more you get rejected, the more sales you'll make. So go out there every day and get hammered. So I would go out and I would start, first of all, at 8 o'clock and then at 7.30. Pretty soon I'd get up at 6 in the morning and I'd be in the parking lot at 7.30 when people came to work. And I'd say, hello, good morning, I'd walk in with them. And I would work all day. And I, I used to run from door to door so I could be rejected more often. And, and then at the night, in the evenings, I would go out and I would knock on doors in the apartments and neighborhoods, home doors. And I would work till 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And I still wasn't making any sales. And I just couldn't understand it. And this went on. Every so often I'd make one sale which would keep me alive, just barely keep me alive to the next sale. After about six months, I noticed there was one guy in our office. His name was Pete. And Pete would roll into the office at about 9.15, customer prospect would come in, they'd have a nice little talk, ho, 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 you wouldn't know what they were saying. Customer would pull out a checkbook, write a big check, sign the order. People would go out, make a couple of additional calls in the morning, have lunch with another prospect, make a sale, make more sales in the afternoon. Pete was earning 10 times as much as anybody in our company, and he wasn't even working very hard. Here I was just hammering away and barely surviving. And Pete always had a pocket full of money, went to great restaurants, He'd walk into a restaurant and he'd peel off 10, 20 euro bills like a, like a mafiosa, good fella, 
Uh, people always give him the best tables. When Pete said, anybody want to go for lunch? Said, oh, you want to get close to Pete? Because Pete could pay. <laughs> you couldn't pay. Remember those days? Um, anyway, so I went up to Pete, and I did something that changed my life, and I hope it changes yours. I said to Pete, Pete, what are you doing differently? Or what are you doing that enables you to make uh, so many sales? How, what are you doing differently from me? He said, well, show me your sales presentation. I'll critique it for you. I still remember that. I said, what? Your sales presentation. I said, you show me yours, and I'll show you mine. <laughs> Because I didn't have a sales presentation. I was doing the blah, blah sell. You know what the blah, blah sell is? Blah, 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 blah. Recite stuff from your brochure. Blah, blah. Say what clever things they told you to say in the office. Blah, 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 blah. And you hoped that in the midst of this, they would say, stop, I'll buy. And it wasn't happening. And that's all I knew to say. It was just to talk fast. You know, we say in uh, Ireland, you have the gift of the gab. So I would talk faster, and if the customer started to lose interest, I talk a little faster or louder. They started to look at their watch, I talk even faster and louder, and pretty soon they say, well, let me think about it. <laughs> and I'd be back out into the street. And I said, so this is what I'm doing. He said, no, no, that's not how you sell. He said, selling is a logical and orderly process, and it has seven parts to it, and if you follow the parts in sequence, sales come out the other end. It's almost like a production line. And if you don't, you don't. And the sales don't happen. It's just, there's, there has nothing to do with you as a person. So he showed me, and he took out a piece of paper. He said, let me show you a, a, a typical presentation. And he started to show me a presentation. And he wrote it down. And I still remember. I can remember the time, place, spot, because it changed my life. What he showed me is that selling is logical. And if you follow the process, you make sales. And if you don't, you don't. And nature is neutral, and nature doesn't care. If you're a complete idiot and you're an immigrant and you arrive here and you don't know anybody, if you follow the process, you make lots of sales, and if you don't, you don't. I learned later that Pete, when he had gotten out of college, and he hadn't done particularly well, he got a job selling for a large company. And the company trained him. And they trained him for about nine months, about half of the time in the office in training and half of the time in the field. And this is what the big companies do, the grown-up companies, is what they do is in the office, in the field, like a windshield wiper, alternately. So you learn and you practice. And they, in IBM, they train you for 18 months. And at, at 18 months, if they are satisfied, for the first time, you can be alone with a customer. Up until that time, you're always supervised by a supervisor who goes out with you until they reach the point where they feel that you are capable of being alone with a customer for the first time. 18 months of training. And that IBM, and I worked for them about 30 times as a speaker, IBM then went on to conquer the world because their salespeople were considered the best salespeople in the world. They could go into any market, anywhere, any company, under any situation, and sell tens of <coughs> billions of dollars worth of product. And once you met an IBM salesperson, there was a, there was a, there was a bounty on IBM salespeople. I worked with these, these uh, personnel consultants or, or executive recruiters. They would be sent out into the field to see if they could get an IBM person. Hire them. If you can get an IBM person to come and work for us, we'll pay them anything. Couldn't get people away from IBM. IBM paid their people like kings and queens. They lived in beautiful homes that, because they knew that the whole focus from Thomas Watson Sr., who founded IBM in 1928, the whole focus was on the salespeople. Train them and train them and train them like an elite crack military team. Whereas the other companies just standing there and say, yeah, here's your cards, here's your brochures. Couldn't understand why IBM was eating their lunch. I learned later, and I worked with probably a thousand big companies and thousands of small ones, all the big companies train and train and train like crack athletic sports teams. And all the average companies <coughs> take training indifferently. They maybe listen to a tape once or have a little pep talk in the office. And so what he told me was this is how to sell. Pete, by the way, could now go after he'd been trained. He could go into any industry <coughs> or any company in any economy or even any country and he could be earning ten times as much as another salesperson within 30 days because he was fully trained, almost like a chef or a diesel mechanic or a doctor. He had the training. All you have to do is put it in place. So he told me these things, and I was thought I had died in the heaven. And I took notes, took frantic notes, and instead of talking all the time, I asked questions. Uh, and instead of blah, 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 I listened carefully <laughs> to answers, and customers began to respond to me differently. And they began to be open to my offerings, and then they began to buy my products or services, and then my sales started to go up and up and up. They began to hockey stick. Well, what I learned, grab some water here. What I learned was um, uh, the law of cause and effect. And the law of cause and effect says that for every 
effect in your life. There are specific causes. If you want to get uh, high sales results, then what you do, that's the effect that you desire, then what you do is you find out who is getting high sales results, and you do the same things they do over and over again. You don't deviate, you don't go off the reservation, as we say, you don't do your own damn thing. What you do is you learn the sales process meticulously until you can do it in your sleep, and then you can be more creative. Then you can add your own personality or temper. If you, if you go to a culinary school, they will teach you how to make the great dishes. The souffles and the cocoa bay and, and so on. And what they'll do is they will supervise you and they will teach you how to make this meticulously. And in exact detail, exact ingredients, exact everything. And then, once you have mastered it so that you can make it in your sleep, if you want then to add something to it, then you add something to it. The big mistake I have found in almost every field, but especially in sales, is that people start to learn how to sell and then they go off and do their own damn thing. They go off the reservation and they say whatever they want, they, they, they deviate, which is why the big companies send a supervisor out and they watch them and no deviating. Just like a school marm with a ruler, they give them a smack. You deviated from the professional selling presentation we use. And a, a professional presentation will increase your sales by 500%. Literally, once you've learned the presentation, it's almost like becoming a fast gun and able to draw and fire. And you, as a professional, can outsell your comp competitors. <coughs> you can sell higher priced products against lower priced competition. You can sell more products against companies that advertise or have been in the business forever. You can walk into a market and you can eat it alive if you know what you're doing. If you don't, what happens is you'll be struggling, you'll be frustrated, you'll be worried about the economy. Well, what I learned over the years, and by the way, the, the the, the research on this is tens of millions of dollars. One company spent, one series of companies came together, put together a pool of tens of millions of dollars, and paid for 55,000 sales calls to be carefully videotaped and vetted by professionals. And what they did is they would interview the salesperson before the sales call and say, what do you expect to happen? They would interview the customer. Why are you meeting with this salesperson and what is your expectation. Then they would videotape the sales calls and they would look at them and they would then run them dual screen so that you have the salesperson's face and the customer's face throughout the sales conversation. And they would watch the, what the salesperson said, they would watch how the customer responded and reacted, and then if it turned into a sale, they would ask the customer afterwards, why did you decide to buy? And uh, if they decided not to buy, why did you decide not to buy? If they decided to buy after two or three calls, why did they decide to buy after two or three calls? And what happened was almost like a Polaroid photograph. If you remember the Polaroid photograph, you take the photograph and then the chemicals begin and the picture starts to emerge. A picture started to emerge of how top salespeople sell in 32 different industries. And it was, a, it was, it was a, it literally a repeatable, duplicable pattern, like a recipe. It was always the same. And so that's what I began to learn and began to study. So in selling, what you find is you have seven parts. And the seven parts I mean, are, are like the seven numbers in a telephone number. Uh, first is, is prospecting. And prospecting means separating prospects from suspects. Now what is a prospect? A prospect is a person who has one of four qualities. And by the way, marketing is always, always starts with these four qualities because marketing... What's the difference between marketing and sales, by the way? Do you know? People say marketing and sales, sales and marketing, and often, even business people, really don't know the difference. What's the difference? Yes, sir. Uh, could you speak up, please? Marketing is That's very close. Thank you. Um, actually, marketing is the business of getting people to raise their hand. For instance, I would say, anybody here hungry? Yeah, lunchtime, anybody hungry? I'm hungry. So now we know the people who are qualified if you sell food. Okay. Now, selling is converting that person who is hungry to coming to your restaurant rather than somebody else's. So remember, marketing is attracting qualified prospects, and selling is converting them into customers. And it's two separate processes. Peter Drucker uh, says that the purpose of marketing is to make selling unnecessary. And a perfect example, which we all like, is this whole thing with Apple. What Apple's done in the last 10 years, they come out with an iPod, 
and everybody has no idea what an iPod is, and as soon as they understand, you see that Tony, Sony last year shut down their entire Walkland division. It used to be a billion dollars in sales. They shut it down completely. The iPod put them out of business. And then, after two or three years, they come up with an iPhone. What is, it? What is an electronics company doing with an iPhone? I mean, I, the telephones are developed by telephone companies. They come up with a phone that is now selling 50 million a year. It's unbelievable. Then, after two or three years, they come up with the iPad. Anybody got an iPad? We got an iPad. What they do with those is people line up around the block. They don't even know what's in it. But in, in the U.S., I don't know what it's like here, hundreds of people would start sleeping on the sidewalk at midnight, lined up around the block, sleeping on the ground to get the first iPads when the store opened <coughs> this morning and pay $500 a piece. And I understand they're much more expensive here. You should get one over there. <laughs> Those are Irish duties. Anyway. Uh, and they got these iPads. They didn't even know what was in it, but the marketing was so good that people were just fighting and clambering over each other to buy it. The marketing purpose of good marketing is to make selling unnecessary. So what does good marketing do? Good marketing identifies what it is that a prospective customer really wants and really needs and will really pay for, and the marketing says, here it is. is if this is what you want. If this is what you need. If this is what will help you achieve your goal or solve your problem, then this is the product for you, which is what brings people to call, to write, to email, to whatever it happens to be. So the first step is prospecting, and a good prospect has one of four qualities. First of all, they have a problem that is unsolved. Now, you must be absolutely clear. My favorite word in selling, by the way, is clarity, clarity, clarity. I think 90, 95% of your success in life will be clarity about who you are, clarity about what you want, clarity about what steps you need to take to get there. The number one reason for failure is people are unclear of what it is they want. And as a result, they go around in circles. So be clear. What is the problem that your product or service solves? You've heard over and over again that people don't buy products, they buy solutions to their problems. The second part of, of prospecting is what is the um, need that your product satisfies. People buy products that satisfy their needs and wants. And what is it? And the ability to identify that clearly and then to make it clear to your prospect that if this is your situation, this is a solution. For example, what about, well, a simple ad would be headache. You've got a headache, take etc. It's an you know, over-the-counter remedy, excellent remedy for headaches. If you don't have a headache, then this is, of course, of no interest to you. So you're looking for people who have a, an existing want or an existing need for what you have. The process of selling, by the way, is not to sell, to, to find somebody who uh, may or may not have your product or service and convince them that they need it. Your job is to find people who already need it and want it, but have not decided who to buy it from. And, and so that's what marketing is. The third part, do they have a goal that is unachieved? What is the goal that your product or service solves? And finally, the fourth part is, do they have a pain that you can take away? that your product or service takes away. Now here's an interesting discovery, is that nobody cares about your company. I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings coming from all the, the great oceans, but nobody cares about your company, and nobody cares about your product or service, and nobody cares about your background and experience, and nobody cares about you. Nobody cares, nobody cares, nobody cares but you. They don't care what your product is, they only care what your product does. And this is very important to understand. Whatever business you're in, you're in only one business. You're in the business of improving the lives and work of your prospective customers. You're in the business of improvement. From time immemorial, going back 6,000 years to the ancient Sumerian markets, customers buy only one thing. They buy what the product does to improve their lives or work. They buy improvement. So whenever you talk about your product or service, you talk about it in terms of how it improves the life or work of others. Now here's a test for you, and it's a great test. Imagine that you get onto an airplane, and through good luck you upgrade it to business class, and you're sitting next to a business person who may be a prospect for you, all right? And the person turns to you and says, what do you do? And you answer them in terms of what your product does to change the life or work of a customer but you do not mention your product or your service or your company. If you can describe your product without mentioning your product, service, or company, then you know what you're doing. If you have to say, well, I work for ABC company and we sell this, that means that you have no idea what you're doing. You should probably go back to 
you know, working for wages somewhere. McDonald's will be hired. Uh, other questions. But you can have three, five, seven. Always an odd number is better than an even number. And then you write it out and you do it in 14 point font so the person doesn't have to squint to read it. And you space it out so there's room for a person to take notes. So here's your letterhead, and on the top you, have, you write these words, agenda for meeting with, and you write the client's name and make sure that it's spelled correctly, time, date, place, all right? And then you have seven questions. So when you come in to see the prospect, there's a way of selling that, that I've used over the years. It's called going in naked. And going in naked means no brochure, no, 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 no briefcase, nothing. You go in with nothing in your hands. And all you have is an agenda. Maybe you have, actually you have two. And you pull it out and you say, Mr. Prospect, I know how busy you are, so I've prepared an agenda for our meeting today so that we can uh, talk uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, would that be okay with you? Customers absolutely love it when you have an agenda. You're not going to sit there and talk endlessly. You have an agenda. And I've prepared one copy for you, and you give them a copy of the agenda. When I go on sales calls, by the way, I just carry a simple portfolio, just one leather portfolio, which is very simple, has a pad so I can take notes. That's the closest I get. Don't take a briefcase at all. Leave the briefcase in the car. You can always go back and get it if you need it. All right? And so you give them the agenda, and the agenda has seven questions. You say, look, I'm not here to sell you anything today. All I would like to do is ask you these questions and see if we can't help you achieve some of your goals in a cost-effective way. Would that be all right? Customers say, sure. And I've spoken to customers about this. I said, has anybody ever used an agenda on you? I said, they say, yes. And I said, how did you feel? They say, they love it. They love it. And your credibility goes straight up. Because now you've positioned yourself not as a salesperson, but as a consultant, as an advisor as a friend, as a helper. You're not there to sell them something, you're there to help them improve their life or work. And so your questions go from the general to the specific, from the broadest question like, what are you doing now in this area? And how is that working for you? And what are your plans for this, uh, for, 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 for in this area in the future? And what sort of budget do uh, you have? And what sort of things are you looking at, or other companies, and so on? And what kind of timelines do you have? So you go from general to specific. And at the end of asking five or seven questions, and seven is my favorite, the person can take notes. They can take notes because you've left lots of room. And very often, it's clear that the customer, yes, does want, does need, uh, can use, and can afford your product or service. And you haven't tried to sell at all. They call this selling without selling. All you've done is ask good questions. Customers also love it when you have a track to run on, when it's clear that you're going somewhere with your question, and they've got it written down. And then they can take it away, and they can talk to someone else and say, you know, Connor was in here uh, this morning, and he was uh, telling about this, and he's got some very, very good questions here that we need to think about. And they can show it to other people. They can actually sell internally. You know that 95% that of the sale takes place when you're not there today. This is another thing they have found, is people don't buy there. They say, well, let me, uh, let me consider this uh, and go over it with uh, the other decision makers, my wife, my husband, my boss, and so on, and let us talk again. And so sometimes your major goal in your first meeting with a client is just to determine whether or not they're a suspect or a genuine prospect. And then your second goal is to come back. Is your goal is a second meeting to come back with. Sometimes we call this two-step two selling. Is the first meeting is to find out if they're a prospect. The second meeting is to show them what your product or service can do to help them based on the information you've gotten from the first meeting. And what this does is it creates a low-stress, no-stress environment where it becomes clear that you are a professional who's here to help them. You're not here to sell them anything. They don't have to be defensive. They don't have to be watching what they say because you're not trying to sell them anything. And in reality, you are selling because you're building your credibility to a very high level. Now, the other thing that we know is that asking questions is the key to building trust. And talking is not. So you'll find that the very best sales professionals are ask questions. And they ask a lot of questions, and they ask questions that are structured, and then they listen carefully to the answers. There, there's, there's some interesting psychological work that says that when you listen intensely to a person when they're talking, their self-esteem goes up, their blood pressure goes up, their galvanic skin response increases. They actually experience physical and emotional changes when they're intensely listened to by a professional person like yourself. So you'll find that all great salespeople are great listeners, because listening builds trust. So how do you get a chance to listen? By asking questions. And so you find that you don't, that good salespeople are not the, what they have in the movies. 
the fast talkers and quick thinkers and so on. Good salespeople are very genial people. I've had the opportunity over the years to work with the, with the what they call the top of the table, which is the top insurance salespeople in the world. Yeah, they have the uh, million dollar round table, then they have the top of the table, then they have the, the court of the table. Is it the court of the table? As you go higher and higher and higher, up to hundreds of thousands of people, only a, an elite that is earning anywhere from 500 to a million dollars a year actually gets in there. Some of them are making several million dollars a year. So I was visiting with one of these groups and speaking in Hawaii a few years ago, and there were about three or four hundred of them from all over the world. And the interesting thing is you meet them on the lobbies and you meet them at dinner and you meet them around the resort, beautiful resort. Uh, and they're all some of the nicest damn people you ever met. They're nice, they're genuine, they're interested, they're interesting, they're warm, they're friendly, they ask a lot of questions. They don't even know who you are, but you just almost automatically like them. Because when, when somebody asks you questions and listens intently while you answer, you feel happy because somebody's paying so much attention to you. Interesting point, just as a, as, 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 with regard to relationships, the word is, is that we always pay attention to that which we most value. We always listen to people who we consider to be the most important. And so at home, if you really want to have a positive impact on the people at home, and I say this mostly for the men because women know this already, is whenever the woman or even your children, and I've practiced this all my life, talk to you, stop everything, turn off the television, put down what you're reading, and focus in on them like a laser beam. What I say is imagine that your eyes are sun lamps and you want to give the other person's face a tan. <laughs> and just focus in on them and listen to them, lean forward, and listen as though they're about to say one of the most important things in your life and they're only going to say it once and you don't want to miss it. When you do this, you will be astonished at the effect on the other person. And if you do this with your wife, she'll think that you've been drinking or you're up to something. <laughs> <laughs> because it will be so unusual. Uh, and so one of the things, and I've given this advice for years, there's the, the rule is that the first hour when you come home at night, I'm getting off track, but not really, the first hour when you come home at night is called the hour of power. And this is the hour where you recombine, you come back together again as a couple and as a family. And you don't do, and let anything interfere with that hour of power, especially not the television. What do most men do is they come in, they say, where's the control? And they turn on the television and they go through the mail and they sit down and they watch television and they read the newspaper simultaneously. No, from now on, and I've had men come back to me and say, you cannot. It was astonishing. My wife took a week to get over it. He would come home, and instead of talking, and men believe that their day has been the most fascinating period of time since Jesus walked the earth. You know? <laughs> and so they come home, and they love to talk, and talk and talk, talk, talk and talk and talk and talk about every detail of their day. And women are wonderful. They listen, and they nod, and they do their grocery lists, and think about other things, and appear to be paying attention to you. But if you ask a woman when you come home, she'll say, well, how was your day? And if you're not careful, you will launch into it for an hour. I was reading something from a comedian uh, in, in Hollywood. She said, I love going to my shrink. She said, my psychiatrist, I could sit there and talk for an hour uninterrupted, just like a man on a first date. <laughs> but, it's all, <laughs> but it's also just like a man when he comes home from work. You can talk for an hour under rubbish, unless he wants to go and watch television. Television will interrupt. So the next time you go home, try this. Is when she says, How was your day? You say, Pretty good. How was your day? And you ask her about her day. Now she'll be so shocked. She'll say, well, It was fine. What did you do? She'll try to turn it around on you. You say, No, no, tell me what you did. What did you do starting this morning? What was the first thing you did when you went to work? And then you just keep asking her questions about her day. First of all, you'll find that her day was as interesting or more interesting than yours. Second of all, she'll be astonished. Third of all, women's greatest need is for attention, respect, and affection from the man in their life. And when you give her undivided attention and affection and respect, it will have such an enormously warming effect on her, it will make her very, very happy. And when you do that to your children, it will cause your children to feel wonderful about themselves and about you as a parent. These are just a couple of little things to throw out there. Ladies, how am I doing? Yeah. Right on. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I've been well trained. <laughs> so, 
So it's the same thing in working with customers. You know, there's a there's wonderful little line, is be kind, everybody you meet is walking a rough road or is, is, is facing a difficult path. Everybody you meet's got problems and difficulties. There's nothing that makes a, a prospective customer feel happier than for you to be pleasant and be positive and ask them questions and lean forward and listen to their answers. Listen to them and make them feel valuable and important. And what happens is the more valuable and important you can make that person feel, the faster all their defensiveness just drops, like shields, they just drop. And they start to like you and be open to you, and they're almost ready to buy your product or service long before you even mention what it is. Sometimes if you're really good at this, the customer at a certain point will say, by the way, what do you sell? Because I'd like to buy some. <laughs> and you find that selling this way is so much easier. There's no stress on your part. There's no stress on the customer's part. So that's phase two. First of all, separate prospects from suspects. You don't want to build an intimate relationship with someone who can never buy. Second of all, build rapport and trust. And Shakespeare said, make haste slowly. In other words, this part is where the whole sale is determined by whether or not the person likes and trusts you. So go slowly. It's sort of like, uh, imagine you're single and you go to a party or a social gathering and there's a, a pretty woman there. And you say, hi, you're a pretty woman. <laughs> well, there may be a time for that, but this is too soon. <laughs> now, what is the equivalent in sales? We call this sales malpractice. The equivalent in sales is where you walk in and say, I'm, hi, Connor, I'm Brian Tracy. Every time I go my product or service which is the same as doing the pounce. I know women know what the pounce is. Um, is that you, it's pouncing on the customer before you've even established a rapport, even before they know uh, anything about you. You do the pounce. Imagine um, going to a doctor right here in Dublin. You go to a doctor, any doctor who is a qualified doctor will follow a three-step process. And the three-step process is always the same, because if you go to a doctor in Hong Kong or San Diego or Tokyo, it's always the same. First of all, first thing they will do is what? Go to the doctor, you've got an ache or a pain such that you've gone to the doctor. What's the first thing the doctor will do? Listen to you. They'll do an examination. Before you get in to see the doctor, they'll take your blood pressure, they'll take your pulse, they'll uh, take your temperature, and so on. And then you go in and the doctor will do an examination. A stethoscope, front, back, cough, bend over, and a whole bunch of other things. All right? Sometimes they'll do urine tests and, and blood tests and all kinds of things. But the first thing they do is an examination. A doctor would never think of doing, doing or saying anything to you about your situation until they've examined to find out what it is. The second thing that the doctor will do is he'll take all that information, either at this meeting or later, and uh, they'll bring it together, test, lab results, and they will create a diagnosis. And they will say to you, based on what we've discovered, based on what you've said, based on your aches and pains, this is what we think, this is what I think is the situation. And there's two or three ways that we can deal with this, maybe with pills, with surgery, with treatment, with waiting, and so on. And then they will give you a prescription. And the prescription or recommendation for a course of treatment is the third part. So if you can imagine three balls, ball one, examination, ball two is diagnosis, and then ball three is recommendation or prescription. Every doctor in the world does it this way. Now imagine you went to a doctor, and you said, Doctor, I've really got these pains. I've been having them for two or three months. You won't go to an internist. And the doctor says, good, take these pills. You'll be fine. <clears throat> well, don't you want to do any tests or any exams or ask me any questions? No, no, I'm really busy today. Just take these pills. I, I work with sore stomachs all the time. Take these pills. They'll be fine. Or say the doctor says, you've got a sore stomach? Oh, I, I don't. I probably put some form of gastroenteritis. Get up here on the table. Let's cut. Nurse, bring me a scalpel. Okay, let's get in here. Let's get in there and let's see what we got. Let's open you up. But you say, whoa, wait a minute. This person must be crazy. They're not going to do any tests. They're just going to start doing surgery on the first visit. What would we call this? What we call this when a doctor does not follow proper medical procedures. Practice, we call it malpractice. What do we call it when a salesperson walks right in and starts talking about their product and service? We call it sales malpractice. And it's just like a doctor who practices malpractice, who, who engages in malpractice will lose their license, a salesperson who engages in sales malpractice will lose their income, or basically will struggle. As we say, salespeople who engage in sales malpractice have skinny kids. Uh, so, 
So your job and my job is to take the time to, to do the examination by asking good questions. And it leads us to stage three. What are we going for time? Okay, all right. Uh, stage three, I have to hurry through these stages. Stage three is identifying needs accurately. This is where you actually ask really good questions about the customer's situation and wants and needs, and you test your answers and back and forth until the customer is clear that yes, this is, uh, yes, I do have a genuine want or need for what you're selling. And it is in the asking questions that you actually build the trust and set the stage for the actual sale. If you don't ask enough questions and you start to make recommendations, you still have not mentioned your product or service, by the way. Yes, you have separated the prospect or suspect by checking what they need. You have built rapport and trust and credibility. You're now asking questions and focusing in on the customer. The customer must feel that you are like a consultant, an advisor, a helper. You're not trying to sell, you're trying to help. Just like when you go to a doctor and the doctor does tests and asks you questions. They're not trying to sell their services, they're trying to help you. And once you get this feeling, this person's not trying to sell me something, they're trying to help me improve my life and work, it changes completely. At the end of this questioning process, the customer should be crystal clear, yes, I really do need what you're selling. Sometimes when people say, I'm not interested, it's because they're not clear that they actually need what you're selling. And your job is to say, oh, I didn't think you'd be interested. This is one of the answers we used to use. Say, I'm not interested. I didn't think you'd be interested. That's why I'm calling. Most of our very best clients were not interested when we first spoke to them. And now they've become our best customers and they recommend us to their friends. The fourth stage in selling is the presentation. And the presentation is a logical and orderly sequence where you show the customer how the, the wants and needs that you have mutually identified can be satisfied with your product or service. Your product or service does not have to be the best or the cheapest. It has, just has to be the right product for this customer at this time. And you show them that based on what you've said, I think our product or service can help you achieve your goals in a cost-effective way. Let me show you how. And then you simply demonstrate how your product or service is the perfect choice. The very best way to sell a product or service is what is called anecdotal selling. And I teach this extensively, but anecdotal selling is where you tell success stories about other people who have used your product or service and how happy they are. You find that a customer will forget everything you tell about your product or service probably by the next day, or about 80 or 90 percent. They'll remember the story for years. The primary reason why people buy your product or service is because you told a great story about someone else who was a little bit hesitant, but they bought it and how happy they were afterwards. Sometimes I say, if you're working with a sales group, once you, ha you should have a, a, a customer story meeting where everybody is responsible for bringing their best story. And they share the best story of their happiest customer. And here's the point. It doesn't have to be your customer. It just has to be a customer of your product. And some of the best companies will share stories from throughout the country. And the person will say, let me tell you about one of our customers down in County Cork. And he had this situation, or she had this situation, and they used this, and this is what they said two months afterwards. And you tell the story. If you can get them to write a testimonial that says, this is what happened to me, I was really skeptical, I was nervous about the price, but I decided to go ahead, and oh, I'm so glad I did, because this is what's happened to me since. One good story can make you rich. I've worked with people who've gotten into the million dollar round table, passed a million dollars a year in straight commission income with a single great story which they wait, and they wait, and then they use at exactly the right time. And the story just demolishes all sales resistance. So think about saying, when you're making a presentation, think about stories. And share stories. If you have good stories, share them with others. So if there's five or six of you, each of you has five or six great stories that you can use. There's nothing more powerful than stories in, 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 a, in a sales presentation, because that is how people think. People decide based on the right brain. All decision making is made in the right brain, and the right brain is activated with stories and pictures. And when you tell a story or tell a story, what happens is people start to see themselves as the primary actor in the story. Here's an interesting discovery. I keep making discoveries in this field. It is that a person cannot buy your product or service until they can mentally see themselves using it. If you are thinking of buying a new car and you go to a new a car lot, What's the very first thing that they do? They get you into the car and drive in. Why? It's because they know that it's not possible for you to drive a car by standing up, buy a car, standing there looking at it. 
They want to get you in it and feeling it and shifting the gears and smelling it and adjusting it. And they always take you on a particular route around these corners and everything else so that you get the feeling of the wheels. You know what I'm talking about? And so what happens is when you come back, you have a mental picture of what it would be like to own this uh, car. Same thing if you're thinking of buying a home. They take you through every single room. They tell you how the kids could be here and you'd be here and you put the television here. But what they're trying to do is give you a mental picture. So when you go home, you have a picture of what it would look like. If you go to buy clothes, you'll find you buy clothes. What do they have all over the, the showing room? Mirrors. So that you can see what you would look like if you bought the clothes. So it's the same thing when you are selling a product or service. One of the most powerful words, sets of words you can use is just imagine. Just imagine if you were using this, or just imagine having this. Or, or here's another thing you can say, it's called talking past the sale. When you are using this service, you will find that it does this. And when you use this service, you will find that you will get this. Or when you're using this product, you'll find you'll get this result. What you're doing is you're creating a mental picture in the customer's mind of how they will be after the sale. Remember, almost 100% of the decision to buy is determined by how the customer thinks he or she will feel after the sale. So always talk about how you will be after the sale. What it will do for you, the change or improvement it will take, that will take place in your life as a result of using the product or service. Here's the rule, and this is a million dollar rule. 95% of your selling should be focused on the outcome, result, or transformation that takes place between where you are and using the product or service. 5% should be on the product, service, company, you, background, history, and everything else. 95% on the transformation. Because nobody cares about how you got there. They only care about what's in it for me. How will I be afterwards? Right? Notice when they sell vacation trips to the south of Spain or, or to the Canary Islands. They have a beautiful poster. They have this absolutely beautiful beach, warm palm trees, sunshine, clear sky. A couple, you, supposedly, you and your spouse, you're supposed to project into that, walking on this absolutely beautiful beach or basking in this, in this beautiful pool. There never seems to be anybody else around. You go there and half the population in Europe is there. But, 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 but it's, so, so what you do is you get a visual picture of yourself and your spouse in a beautiful tropical area, quiet, tropical, sunshine, warm, and you get that picture in your mind. Now, do you get the picture in your mind of packing your bags and going to the airport and parking your car and going through customs and security and getting on the plane and ordering drinks on the plane in the seat and, and getting to your room and under No! You don't want any of that. You're, you're, all you think about is walking on the beach. <laughs> all those things are the particulars. And you went to, what does tra travel companies sell? They talk about the trip to the airport and the flights and they talk about picking you up at the airport and the hotel and they greet you at the hotel. Nobody cares about that stuff. What we care about is getting onto that damn beach where there's 50 million other people, it turns out. <laughs> this isn't the beach in the poster. The fifth part of selling is answering objections. And there are, are no sales without objections. Why is it that people ask, uh, have objections or questions about your product or service offering? Price, details, <coughs> operations, fact, background, use, utility. Why do they have objections? They're unclear. Well, they're unclear, and also they're trying to reduce risk. Remember, the number one reason that people don't buy from you is perceived risk. Not real risk, because we know that what you sell is a fine product or service, and it, you stand behind it. Uh, we know that. The customer doesn't know that, and the customer has been burnt so many times. So the customer asks questions, what about this and what about that, to reduce risk in their own mind to ask questions that someone else might ask. Why did you buy that? Well, what about this? And you say, well, I asked them about that, and it's, and it's OK, because they have guarantees, warranties, service, follow-up, backup, and so on. So reducing the perception of risk is really important. And so people ask questions. Can I get it cheaper somewhere else? Most salespeople have what is called price neurosis, about two-thirds of salespeople. That means they think that price is everything, even especially here in Ireland, where we are a little bit sensitive to price. <laughs> but they think that price is everything when, when if you do customer surveys after the purchase, where the customers say, what about the price, 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 can I get it cheaper, 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 can I get it cheaper, 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 can I get it lower, 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 I can't afford it, can't afford it, can't afford it, customers get the feeling that price is a major issue. If you go back 30 days after the purchase and say, Mr. Prospect, why did you buy? 
this product or service from this company. They say, oh, because I like the color, and I like the size, I like the shape, I like the way it worked, and they had these features and benefits, you could do this, you could do that, and all these things, and it fitted in well with, they say, whoa, whoa, what about price? Now, price is important, I just don't want to, I don't want to overpay, but price is not a reason for buying. I sometimes ask this question, I can prove that price is never the reason for buying anything. Want me to prove it to you? Say yes. Yes. Well, it's a magic trick, okay? <laughs> Is there a single person in this room who has a single item about their person that they bought solely because it was the cheapest available? I rest my case. <laughs> not a single person here has anything that they bought solely because it was cheap. You're not going to buy clothes because they're cheap, even though they're ugly and ill-fitting. You're not going to buy a pen that doesn't work. You're not going to buy shoes that don't fit because they're cheap or look ugly. You'll, in other words, appearance, use, size, comfort, shape, fitting with your wardrobe, all these things have to be solved first, and then you want to get the best price. And what we know is that customers, even in Ireland, do not want the lowest price in most cases. And I'll tell you why. The only reason they want the lowest price is there's no difference between the two items. If the two items have the same respective level of quality, then they'll want the lowest price because there's no difference. But if there's a whole series of other features, they don't want the lowest price because the lowest price is always associated with what? And inferiority, poor quality, breakdowns, disappointments, anger, frustration, wish I never bought it at all. People are always willing to pay a little bit more to lower the risk of the purchase, to raise the level of comfort, so that they will be happy after the purchase and not have to worry about it. You and I have all had the experience of very cleverly buying a cheap product, and afterwards we had so many problems with that product, we wish we had never done it at all. What else? We wish we had paid more for the product so we didn't have it. So answering objections is important. And what you do is you think through, and this is an exercise that you can do, by the way. It's a great exercise. It's called a sentence completion exercise. And you can do this as a sales team. Remember, you can double your sales by either increasing your sales effectiveness or by removing the objections that hold people back. There's always one major objection that causes a person not to buy. And each person, each prospect, may have a different objection, or the objections will never be more than six. It's called the law of six. I learned it when I was 24, is there's never more than six objections to any offer. So you use this exercise by saying, let's complete this sentence as an individual or as a team. Is we could sell to every prospect if they just didn't say <coughs> dot, 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 complete the sentence. If they just didn't say it costs too much, or just didn't say I'm happy with my existing supply, or just didn't say I can't afford it, or just didn't say I'm not in the market right now, or just didn't say cash is poor. In other words, write down everything that people say. And sometimes you'll end up with 20 or 30, or I worked with one company that came up with 100 objections. And then you'll look at them and you'll find that they break down neatly into never more than six categories. And you can find an answer. You can create an answer that answers the, all the objections in that category and eliminates the objection forever. So think through, what do you say when people say this? What is your answer? And again, the best salespeople I've ever worked with, when they, they, they almost know. They know that at the moment of closing the sale, the prospect's gonna come up with this one objection, and they smile like, I own you. <laughs> they smile, and they say, that is a good question. Let me see if I can answer it for you, and then they just turn over the cards and they've got an answer fully prepared that demolishes the objection and eliminates any obstacles to making the sale. And for every, we say for every problem under the sun, there is a solution or there is none. If there's a solution, go and find it. If there isn't, never mind it. So for every objection that a customer gives you, there's an answer. If there isn't an answer, if the company is going bankrupt and they're moving the furniture out, uh, the sheriff or the police are there and the decision maker is being marched off to jail for investment, this is probably an overcomable objection, all right? <laughs> an unovercomable objection. Because, but in most cases, what people give as an objection is not really a reason not to buy. It's just a reason in their mind that you can remove. Now, the next uh, uh, step number six is to close the sale. And closing the sale means to ask the customer to buy. And there are several different ways. I produced a program, which I think is for sale here. I produced a program some years ago called The Psychology of Selling. And all over the world, 16 languages other than English, it has taken people from rags to riches. It's made them millionaires and multimillionaires. 
It's taken them from junior salespeople to owning the company they started to work for. The stories I've heard would bring tears to your eyes. What has happened, because what it does is it tells you about wants and needs and customer objections and different 19 different reasons why a customer will object on the basis of price and how you determine which objection it is and how to answer it and how to manage your time and, and, your, and your mind and so on. People have used that, including closing techniques. And I've had people say to me, you know, I lost the sale and then I remembered the words and I turned to the customer and asked the closing question and I got the sale. I made thousands of euros with a single sale and I lost the sale, but I remembered the words. When I started off selling, I was <coughs> terrible. I, every, by the way, Every master, they say, was once a disaster. Every top salesperson was once terrible. They couldn't feed themselves or their family. Every salesperson in the top 10% started in the bottom 10% and struggled upward. And when I started off, I was terrible. And when it came to closing, I would go into a form of semi-paralysis. My heart would pound, my stomach would churn, my, my temples would sweat, and the customer would get the feeling that something awful is about to take place here. And the customer would go into a fetal crouch and start to, pr to protect and defend themselves, and we'd be like two scorpions in a bottle. And I'd finally blurt out, well, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and the customer, that's a lay down question, the customer would say, well, I think I like to think it over. And I'd say, oh, great, you think it over. I'll think it over, and we'll think it over, I'll think it over, I'll get back together sometime in the future. I go back to the car and say, oh my God, a sale almost took place in there. <laughs> Jeez, that was close. <laughs> and then I realized that the mistake that I made is I didn't know how to ask for a sale. I didn't know how to make a souffle. I may be able to make omelets and make scrambled eggs and pork roast, but I didn't know how to make a souffle. I didn't know how to end the conversation, so I began to study closing techniques intensively, and it transformed my life. And I'm not talking about manipulation or clever, fast talk. I'm just talking about really professional ways that you like what I've shown you so far, yes. Well, then why don't you give it a try? Would you like to go ahead with it now, or, or would you like to do it a little bit later? And it's just very, very easy questions. They just invite people to buy your product or service. But if you don't know the words, and it's interesting, the words work in any language. They work in Chinese, they work in Russian. If you don't know the words, you're sitting there, you know what faced. Uh, and you don't know what to say, and you get nervous. And so therefore, learn how to ask closing questions. And you'll find that for your product or service, there's one or two ways that work virtually all the time for a qualified prospect. And those are all you have to memorize. You may have to learn a lot, and then you may have to practice quite a bit. Let me ask you a question. Uh, when I was young, I uh, started to study languages. I now speak French, German, and Spanish, some better than others. So I've been literally fluent in all three languages, but they, they get rusty if you don't use them a lot. Uh, I can speak almost fluent German, which is a hard language to learn. And I speak big smatterings of other languages. The reason I learned languages when I started off, I didn't know anything but English, is I read something and it said that the reason that non-Europeans don't learn foreign languages is because they feel so nervous when they actually start. They see themselves as making a fool of themselves. They see themselves as trying to speak and people not understanding them, so they shrink back. Whereas Europeans, because they're so used to traveling, will pick up a language and they'll try it. If it doesn't work, they'll try it again. They'll, they'll keep saying words in the different languages. Somebody suddenly understands them. So I decided that I would learn the languages and I would not feel, uh, this is time is up, okay. Uh, I would not, you're right. I would not get uh, upset if people didn't understand. I found later in life the reason why people don't learn and grow is because they're afraid of feeling clumsy and awkward during the learning period. They move out of their comfort zone, which is usually a lower performance than they like. But to get to a higher level of performance, they have to go through a discomfort zone. And most people, 80-90% of the population, shrinks from the discomfort zone. So here's the question. Is anybody, can anybody here ride a bicycle? Say yeah. yeah. All right. What happened when you rode your first bicycle? You fell down. Now, did you just lie there and cry and get up and go back to the house and never try again? Or what did you do? You got back up on the bicycle and somebody ran alongside of you and so on. And you kept doing that until finally you could ride the bicycle by yourself. It's the same thing with learning any new skill. Is never be afraid of falling down and scuffing your knees and your elbows uh, when you learn a new skill. Because that is inevitable and unavoidable. 
be prepared to feel clumsy and awkward and foolish and make mistakes and fall down. And if you're willing to do that, there's nothing that could stop you from excelling in your field. Step number seven is getting resales and referrals from your prospect or from your customer, and that's from taking such good care of them that they buy from you again and they bring their friends. They buy from you again and bring their friends. Remember, the job of the, cut of the salesperson is to create and keep a customer. The measure of success is customer satisfaction. And what is the measure of customer satisfaction? Repeat business. Repeat business. In other words, they come and they buy again and they bring their friends. The only way you can get into the top 10% in terms of income is by becoming such a good person in the sales conversation that people like you and see you as a friend, as a helper, as a guide, and they want their friends to enjoy the same experience. And when you start to create what we call a golden chain of referrals, you'll be astonished at how much more successful you become. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope that these seven steps have been helpful to you and they will help you in the future. And the wonderful thing is that each person here has the ability to get into the top 10% and become one of the highest paid people in the entire country of Ireland. Irrespective of economic ups and downs, you have total control of your own destiny by engaging in continuous and never-ending improvement in your field. And I hope you do. Thank you. Very much.